principles of the faith. Uh, it's been one I've been very concerned about because for years we have said, uh, well, a cult is a group that professes to be Christian but denies one or more of the essentials of the faith. And then people say, well, what are the essentials of the faith? And after saying, duh, and uh, uh, stuttering around a little So it's very crucial. Uh, how do we know uh, what view is heretical? How do we know what view is uh, cultic? How do we know what view is unorthodox if we don't know the standard for orthodoxy? Now, immediately coming to mind is back in the 1920s to the 30s, there were five or six fundamentals that were established, and many people will hearken back to those. But if you look at the list, there are really two lists of five that overlap by four, and it made a list of about seven. It was the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, the bodily resurrection, the second coming, the inspiration of Scripture. If you look at that, clearly it's not a complete list. It says nothing about the depravity of man. It says nothing about the Trinity. Uh, there are a number of uh, very important essential doctrines that aren't part of that list. That just happened to be the ones that uh, where uh, fundamentalism and liberalism came in conflict were the uh, most important ones to them. And so it was not a comprehensive list. So some time ago, I gave um, myself the task of putting together uh, a list and said, how would you go about putting together a list of the essentials of the faith? And I thought, well, let's approach it two ways. Let's approach it logically from the Bible, uh, which doctrines are logically necessary to make the gospel possible. And then let's approach it historically and see what happened in the unfolding of the early church. And to my utter surprise, after spending several years on that and finishing the volume on it, my systematic theology on that topic, I came up uh, with identical lists from both. That is, the uh, list uh, that the early fathers came up with and the lists that are logically necessary were one and the same. And this is the result of that study. Uh, everybody agrees to this statement. An essential is unity and non-essential is liberty and in all things charity. Most people mistakenly think St. Augustine said it. It was not Augustine. It was uh, Rupertus Meldinius in 1627 when the Lutherans were at each other's throat, uh, throats and were uh, arguing with each other. And uh, they needed a little uh, uh, pacification in Rupertus Meldinius. Uh, in 1627, uh, according to Philip Schaff, History of the Christian Church, Volume 7, said that he proposed this statement, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. But we're right back to the same question. What are the essentials that we should be unified around? Uh, well, on any count, an evangelical, the essential is the gospel. That's what we were commanded to preach that's what uh, the heart of the message of the early church was. The gospel is essential because that's the means by which we're saved. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. So if the gospel is that which saves us, then it's going to be those doctrines that are clustered around and necessary prerequisites of the gospel that are going to be fundamental. And indeed, Paul defined the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, as according to the scripture, Jesus died, was buried, rose, and appeared uh, to many. And so we have the content of the gospel here. And then Paul uh, spelled out three aspects of the gospel. Uh, salvation from the penalty of sins, which we normally call justification. I was saved at that moment in the past. Salvation from the power of sin, which we call sanctification. I am now being saved in the present becoming more and more like him, and then salvation from the presence of sin, glorification in the future, I will be saved. So granted that those are the three aspects of the gospel, the three tenses of the gospel, then I ask uh, myself, how many doctrines are essential to those three aspects? If the gospel in its fullness is justification, sanctification, and glorification, then how many biblical doctrines are necessary to make those possible? And I uh, discovered that uh, the book of Romans helps us uh, because the book of Romans, minus the first three chapters, which talks about condemnation, you can't be saved unless you're lost, you can't be rescued unless you're drowning, 
uh, talk about condemnation, and then the next three sections of Romans deal with these three aspects, Romans 3b through 5, justification, uh, declaring us righteous positionally, uh, sanctification, Romans 6 and 7, making us righteous progressively, and glorification, Romans 8, making us righteous permanently, that those three aspects of the gospel are all spelled out in detail in the book of Romans, chapters 1 through 8. Now, if that's the case, there are three aspects of the gospel. If the gospel is the core essential, then what needs to be true in order for all of those things to happen? And I concluded that for the first stage of salvation, justification, there are 11 doctrines that need to be true. Uh, human depravity, Mary's virginity, Christ's purity or sinlessness, Christ's deity, his humanity, that there's one God, that he's triune, uh, that grace is absolutely necessary, your faith is a condition for receiving it, Christ died an atoning death, and he was raised again from the dead. Eleven doctrines essential to make your justification possible. Then the next stage of salvation, sanctification, the bodily ascension and uh, Christ's priestly intercession are necessary. If he's not there pleading our cause uh, to the Father as the accuser of our brethren accuses us, if he's not living to make intercession for us day by day, we can't have the basis that makes sanctification possible. And of course, he had a bodily ascend into heaven because he said, if I don't go, Holy Spirit's not going to come, and uh, sanctification is not going to be possible. Then the third stage of salvation, essential uh, to glorification, is, of course, Christ has to bodily return again. If I go, I'll come again, receive you unto myself. This same Jesus who is taken away will so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. So there are 14 doctrines necessary for salvation in the broad sense of the term, Therefore, by definition, there are 14 soteriological fundamentals of the faith. Anyone who denies any one of these, and remember 1 John, the main heresy there is docetism, which is denying Christ's humanity, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's equally a heresy to denying his deity. That all of these truths are necessary prerequisites for salvation from the penalty, power, and presence of sin. Fourteen fundamentals, not five, not six, uh, not seven, but fourteen fundamentals of the faith. Let's just briefly take a look at them. Uh, human depravity. There is no one righteous, not even one. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be held accountable to God. As I said a moment ago, you can't be saved if you aren't lost. And you can't be lost unless you realize you're a sinner. And so human depravity is a prerequisite to uh, the gospel, and one of the great fundamentals of the faith is to uh, admit that humans uh, are totally incapable in and of themselves to initiate or attain their own salvation. Uh, they're born, as Augustine said, with the propensity to sin and the necessity to die. Mary's virginity. She was found to be with child through the Holy Ghost. What is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he will save his people from their sins. Notice how salvation is directly connected to the virgin birth. While it itself doesn't seem to be a soteriological doctrine, it is because it's directly connected with Christ who couldn't possibly be the one to save us unless he was sinless. The virgin shall be with child and to have a son, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The very incarnation and salvation connected to it. Uh, Christ's sinlessness. If he isn't sinless, he can't die for our sins. And the Bible is very clear. He had no sin. He was without sin. He was without blemish or defect. He had no sin, no deceit found in his mouth. He was the righteous, uh, and he is pure. Christ's sinlessness, if he's going to die for our sins, he can't be a sinner himself. Four, Christ's deity. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He has to be God in order to mediate between God and man. He has to be God to reach to God, man to reach to man, and he has to be the God-man to be the mediator between the two. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, but unto the Son he saith, Your throne, O God. Definite uh, article. The Father calling the Son God. Uh, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am the I am Yahweh of Exodus 3.14. And Thomas confessed the climax of the Gospel of John, My Lord and my God. Another essential doctrine uh, is Christ's humanity. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Christ has come in the flesh, 1 John 4, 2, and if you deny that, you're of the anti-Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He was made in human likeness, Philippians 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity and so forth. Christ's humanity is absolutely essential, and to deny that is to deny a fundamental of the faith. In addition to that, uh, God's unity. There has to be one God. If you, don't, if you believe in polytheism, you can't be saved. Polytheists can't be saved because they aren't believing in the true God, the maker of heaven and earth, as the creed uh, put it. Uh, so God's unity is essential to salvation. You have to be a monotheist. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Before me no God was formed, and there won't be any after me. Jesus said, this is the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. For there is one God, and there is no other God but one. Over and over the Bible stresses the unity of God. One God, the God, the creator of the universe, is the only one who can save. And if you don't believe in him, uh, you can't be saved. Uh, seven. Uh, God's triunity. All three members of the Trinity are necessary for salvation. Now we'll get in a moment to the question, how many of these do you have to believe to be saved? That's not the question we're on. How many of these have to be true before you can be saved is the question we're on. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, all three members of the Trinity are right there. Uh, the Spirit of God descended. A voice from heaven said, this is my Son. Uh, he said, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three members there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the triunity of God is necessary. As St. Augustine said, God is love, but to be love, you have to be a lover, to have a loved one, and a spirit of love between them. Each member of the Trinity has a role. The Father plans salvation. The Son accomplishes salvation. The Holy Spirit applies salvation. All functioning to make salvation possible. Doctrine number eight, the necessity of grace. In every age, uh, it's absolutely necessary for people to believe that they can't do it on their own. That they are sinners. That apart from Christ, we can do nothing. It's by his grace that we're saved through faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not because of righteous things that we've done, but because of his mercy. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Clearly, grace is an absolute essential for salvation. Nine, the necessity of our faith. You have to believe. Abraham believed. He's used as the paradigm in the New Testament. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Hebrews 11, I think, summarizes the four things necessary for salvation in every age. He that comes unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is necessary. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited for righteousness for the just shall live by faith. Also essential to justification is Christ's atoning death. For even the Son of Man didn't come to, serve, uh, to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Christ died for our sins and so forth. Many scriptures come to your mind. Without the atonement, there is no salvation. Finally, for justification, uh, you need the bodily resurrection. Why? Because he was delivered uh, over to death for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. Without the resurrection, there is no salvation. 
Paul said in Romans 10.9, that you have to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead for you to be saved. And if Christ died for our sins, he was raised the third day. And if Christ didn't arise from the dead, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And the one who was raised was raised in the same body in which he died. The soul didn't die, just the body died. Only the body can be resurrected. So believing in the physical resurrection of Christ is an absolute essential for justification. Eleven fundamental soteriological doctrines uh, with regard to the first stage of salvation. How about the second stage? Essential to sanctification. Not just declaring us righteous, but making us righteous day by day. Well, Christ's bodily ascension. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It's uh, for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Consular, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. And if I uh, go, I will send him to you. So salvation was predicated on the fact that Christ had to bodily ascend. He had to present, as it were, to the Father by virtue of his blood... Hebrews says he entered into heavens. So he had to present the finished work of the cross to the Father, get the Father's approval on what he had done on a behalf of sinners. God had to be appeased, propitiated, uh, used many times, First John 2, for example, for us to be saved. Then it says, when he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands, blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And the angels said, as he was taken up before their very eyes uh, in the cloud, they were looking intently in the sky as he was going away. And the angels said, this same Jesus, which is taken away from you, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. So the bodily ascension, uh, we we'll celebrate Ascension Sunday for nothing. It's important in the soteriological calendar for salvation. Finally, for the second stage, Christ's priestly intercession. He's doing something there at the right hand of the Father. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, there were two reasons why the priest never sat down in the Old Testament. One, there was no chair in the uh, tabernacle or the temple. And two, their work was never done. Uh, these... Uh, Priests stand daily offering up the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet apart from sins. Therefore, he is able to save completely. Save what? San save in the second sense, sanctified from the power of sin. He always lives to make intercession for them. But if anyone sins, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So there are 13 doctrines, 11 for justification, 2 for sanctification, and the, fourth, uh, the 14th one, the second coming, is essential to glorification. And of course, salvation isn't complete. We wait to wit, Romans 8, for the redemption of the body. Salvation is incomplete. We've been declared righteous. We've been in the process of being made righteous, but we haven't been permanently made uh, righteous until he comes back. And when we shall see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He's coming with clouds. Every eye will see him. Sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky. Behold, I am coming quickly. And in the 1 John 3, uh, we read... Uh, we will be like him uh, when he comes and we purify ourselves, we're told, with this uh, hope uh, to see him who is the righteous one. Now, of course, there are two subdivisions to the second coming. When he comes, he's got to separate the sheep from the goats. Uh, the sheep, he says, come unto me, blessed my father, the goats uh, depart from me, wicked into eternal uh, fire. And so uh, these doctrines are important, part of the 14th point. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me and my Father's house. There are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we'll see the beatific vision. We see him face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. This is the perfect 
point of salvation where we will be sinless. Now we can sin less uh, by his power, then we will be sinless. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's heaven. Meanwhile, uh, in hell, the only other alternative, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. John said, I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before him. The dead were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Fourteen doctrines, 14a and b, all necessary for salvation. Now, all uh, essentials are normatively necessary to be true for salvation to be possible. So I think when we're asking, what is a cult? A cult is some uh, one who professes to be Christian who denies one or more of these 14 uh, salvific doctrines. But not all essentials are normatively necessary to believe explicitly uh, to be saved today. In other words, you don't have the plan of salvation doesn't have 14 doctrines in it. If you don't accept all these 14 doctrines, you can't be saved. Now, the really tough question that I found, at least, is how many things are necessary to believe of these 14 before you can be saved? What really is the content of the gospel? And I think you have to separate that question into two. Necessary to believe in all ages, in all times, or necessary to believe today. Why? We have to separate in two because of progressive revelation. Because uh, when God adds a new revelation, we're responsible for it, just as when the government adds a new law, you're responsible to keep it. Once it's added, promulgated, uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So in the progress of revelation, uh, he has revealed more in the content necessary to believe today than was necessary, say, for example, uh, for the average Jewish person coming to the tabernacle with his uh, lamb to be slain or with the people on the streets of Nineveh who were repenting. I think necessary to believe in all ages, Hebrews 11:7. You wouldn't come unto God if you thought you could do it on your own, so it implies depravity. God's unity, you're coming unto God, not to small g or not to G-O-D-S, but to God. Necessity of grace must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's grace. And, of course, the necessity of faith. So if you ask me to give the universal content of the gospel, what people have to believe in every age, in every stage, in every dispensation, I would say there they are. There's nobody anywhere at any time uh, who didn't have to believe in uh, that they were... Uh, sinful, that there was one true God, that grace was necessary, and expressed their faith in that. Now, the next question is, uh, what's necessary to believe in this age, right now? According to the New Testament, there are four more things you have to believe today. They're in the red. Christ's deity, Christ's humanity, Christ's atoning death, Christ's bodily resurrection. Belief in these truths must be at least implicit with no explicit disbelief. Now, where do we see that? I think we see that in many New Testament passages. Uh, but to summarize it in uh, sentential form, there is one God, we are sinners, Christ is God, Christ is man, Christ died for my sins, Christ rose from the dead, we are saved by God's grace, and we must believe that Christ did this for us. I think that's the minimal content of the gospel necessary in this age for anyone to believe in order to be saved. And, of course, Hebrews 11, 6, we already read. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And, by the way, uh, you don't have to take uh, notes. I have all this written down for you and the stack is up here, but I want you to listen to me uh, and watch the screen and you can have, you can have that later. Uh, the, uh, 
Acts 16.31, and I got the numbers here. They're the numbers of the doctrines listed in square brackets. Ephesians 2.8.9, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. I think curios, as used of Christ in the New Testament, means deity. And the proof of that uh, is one context, my Lord and my God, and two, that oftentimes it's a translation of Yahweh, the word Yahweh from the Old Testament passage as applied uh, to Christ. So when they said believe on the Lord, that implies deity. Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. First Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And you can't deny that he's a man or it's of Antichrist, 1 John 4. Now, if, there, if the gospel is essential, and if there are 14 things that make the gospel possible, 11 for justification, 2 for sanctification, 1 for glorification, uh, then what's conspicuous by its absence? The Bible. Is it? Is the Bible, or belief in the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible, uh, necessary for salvation? Is it necessary for salvation to be true? Question one. Is it necessary to believe it's true in order to be saved? Question two. Uh, we dive now into the deep end of the pool. Uh, first of all, we must distinguish between uh, essentials for having salvation, for salvation being possible, and two, uh, essentials for knowing about salvation. There are 14 things essential to have salvation, but how do you know about salvation? Only because there is an infallible and inerrant Bible. So while the inerrancy of the Bible is not a soteriological fundamental, it's an epistemological fundamental. And we'll uh, elaborate on that in a moment. As Carl Henry once said, Inerrancy is not a test for evangelical authenticity. It's a test for evangelical consistency. You can't be a consistent evangelical because you're denying the very basis on which all the other 14 doctrines are possible. So let's take this as doctrine number 15, inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible. It's a Bible. Uh, all these 14, I don't have 14 fingers, so you'll have to assume this is 14. All these 14 doctrines are based on this one. So this is kind of the essential of the essentials, right? Or let's call it the fundamental of the fundamentals, because I've got a fundamental question to ask you. If the fundamental of the fundamentals isn't fundamental, what's fundamental? The answer is fundamentally nothing, right? <laughs> so it's a very important doctrine because it's fundamental to everything else we believe. Jesus said the Bible is divinely authoritative. Jesus and his disciples said 92 times, to my knowledge, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no other phrase with theological significance in the Bible that's repeated more. It is written. Almost always in the perfect tense. It was written in the past. It stands written in the present. It came as the word of God, and it's still the word of God. You remember three times he defeated the devil with this, Matthew 4, 4, 7, and 10. And in one of them he said, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There's a good description of an inspired, inerrant book. Every, how many words that proceed out of God's mouth can be errant? None. Uh, and he's quoting, it is written, it is written, it is written, saying every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is divinely authoritative. It's imperishable. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my law will not pass away. The law and the prophets, which is a phrase used 12 or 13 times in the New Testament, always means the whole Old Testament, not two-thirds of it. Always means the whole Old Testament. Compare Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in two-thirds of the Old Testament. No, all the scriptures, <laughs> the things concerning himself. Three, it's infallible. That just happens to be the theme verse of the seminary. The scriptures cannot be broken. The scripture uh, is the closest word to infallible. In fact, there are four terms there. Unbreakable, Torah, word of God, uh, and uh, I forget the fourth one. <laughs> In that passage, all which refer to the divine authority of the Bible. It's infallible. It's inerrant. 
He looked at the Sadducees and said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures. That would be kind of silly not to, to say that if the scriptures were also errant. You do err, not knowing the Bible, which is also full of errors. Uh, you do err, not knowing the Bible, which doesn't have any errors, because every word proceeds from the mouth of God. It is historically reliable. It's amusing to me, absolutely amusing, that God picked the most disputed passages in the Old Testament to personally affirm by Jesus in the New Testament. Jonah and the whale. Now, that's a whale of a tail. No, it's a tail of a whale, Jonah said. <laughs> it's not a whale of a tail. Uh, well, that's hysterical. No, it's historical. Uh, Jesus said so. And he said it emphatically. Just as Jonah was... Even so I will be. Now, he wouldn't talk about the historicity of his death and resurrection and compare it to the mythology in the Old Testament. Matthew 24, the flood. If there are, if there are two of three passages that are highly disputed, here they are. Uh, the story of the flood, a literal flood, literally destroying the world. That's what Jesus said. Uh, they came and swept them all away. Six, scientifically accurate. Now, notice here, they came to Jesus with a uh, moral question. Is it right or wrong to divorce for any cause? He gave them a scientific answer. God literally created Adam and Eve. Why? Because you can't separate morality and history. You can't separate fact and value. That's what Immanuel Kant did, and we're still living in the wake of that today. Scientific accuracy of the Bible. Jesus said it. Seven. He said, you've exalted your traditions, your teachings above the word of God. The Word of God is above all human teaching. It's the final authority. So the Bible is infallible and inerrant. Who said so? The Son of God. If the Son of God, who was confirmed by acts of God, said the Bible is the Word of God, then either the Bible is the Word of God or he's not the Son of God. If he's the Son of God, then it must be the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Without Scripture, there is no infallible or for that matter, even reliable source for those 14 doctrines. There's nothing reliable outside of that. Now, there are really three kinds of essentials. Essentials for having salvation, 14. Essentials for knowing about salvation, number 15, the Bible. Essentials for interpreting salvation. See, the chain from God to us, the last link is interpretation. Because the Bible has to be interpreted. And if you don't use the historical grammatical method for interpreting the Bible, you won't get those 14 doctrines. And salvation won't be possible. If you use an allegorical method or a partially allegorical method, it's not going to work. The literal historical grammatical method. Let me give you a few reasons why I believe it. It's the universal approach in everyday life. Just try this sometime. There's a sign that says 65 speed limit. Try going 85, and when you get before the judge, say to him, have you heard of the mystical Bible code? Uh, the number eight is a number of, uh, number six is a number of man. That's a number of imperfection. And five is a number of responsibility. You've got five fingers, in, and you give him a mystical interpretation of that sign, guess what? You're going to pay. Uh, everything in our society depends on the historical grammatical interpretation. Chicken noodle soup. You've got to take that literally, you can't say, and I wonder what it means by chicken. There's got to be some <laughs> mystical meaning here, no? Everything in life, God made it simple, stupid. Uh, the universal approach in everyday life is the literal interpretation. And even those who deny it expect their view to be taken literally. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? Everybody who denies the literal interpretation, try allegorizing their view. You know, Bart, Bart uh, Ehrman uh, holds this uh, postmodern view of interpretation. Uh, that the reader uh, changes the text, try changing his that way. Try, try reading his text and say, oh, I see you believe in inerrancy, uh, right? Uh, three, even symbols and figures of speech have a literal meaning. You say, well, how about figures of speech and, and uh, symbols? They have a literal meaning. The book of Revelation is full of symbols, but it says the seven stars are seven messengers. The seven candle holders are the seven churches, the waters are many people. They say it gives you an interpretation. It has a literal meaning. Symbols uh, don't mean that there's nothing literal there. There is no objective way to test a non-literal interpretation. 
There is an objective way to test a literal one. If I say, this is a brown Bible in my left hand, uh, there's a way to test it. Uh, but if, I, if it's some allegorical thing, how are you going to test it? Five, non-literal views undermine crucial Bible truths necessary for salvation. If you apply these non-literal methods of interpretation to any one of the fundamentals, like the death and resurrection of Christ, you'd be a heretic. So you know something's wrong with the method. The method is denying the fundamental pillars of the faith. So we have three kinds of fundamentals. 16 fundamentals in all. 14 soteriological, one uh, epistemological, uh, and one hermeneutical. In essentials unity, if you don't stand for something, you may fall for anything. Now, I'm not going to die in every hill. I'm pre-trib, uh, pre-mill. I'm not going to die in that hill. Uh, that's not one of the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, as the guy said, I'm so pre, I don't eat post-toasties. <laughs> but that is, not, that is not one of the fundamentals of the faith. But if the 16 are, and I'm willing to die in those hills. I'm not willing to die for who the rider on the red horse and the white horse in Revelation 6 is. As a matter of fact, evangelical scholars differ. Some say Christ and some say Antichrist, which is pretty big difference, right? Uh, I'm not going to die on that hill. Uh, but I'll die uh, not for the man on, who's the man on the red horse, but the man on the red cross uh, who shed his blood for my sins, I'll die on that hill because that's one of the fundamentals of the faith. It's better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. I, I take that from John Carnell, former president of Fuller Seminary, which... Uh, uh, subsequent to that time uh, took energy out of their doctrinal statement uh, to their own detriment. Now if that statement is referring to essentials, I agree a hundred or two hundred percent with it. It's better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. I would rather be divided by the truth of an inerrant Bible than to be united on the basis of the error of believing in an errant Bible. It's one of the fundamentals in non-essentials liberty. Here there are two great errors. Not uniting on essentials, minoring in majors, the error of the left, liberalism, or dividing over non-essentials, majoring in minors, the error of the right, fundamentalism. Now, I, for years, I used to belong to the IFCA, Independent Fundamental Churches of America, or uh, roughly known as I Fight Christians Anywhere. But <laughs> the, I think we probably, it's like the word gay, I think we've lost the word. You know, I used to sing I'm happy and gay since Jesus took my sins away. You notice that it's not even in the hymnal anymore. It's just a, it's a good word we lost. I like the word fundamental. It, it means, you know, the fundamentals. Uh, but I'm afraid since, uh, at least since Islam came on the scene, uh, who are fundamentalist, radical, Muslim, uh, I'm afraid the connotations of the word are so bad that it would be better if we adopt the term essentialism. So far, that's still a good word. The essentials of the faith. I don't mind being called an essentialist. Pray God that I'm not a trivialist. Pray God that I don't take every minor thing and make a major thing out of it. Uh, that's the opposite of liberalism. Here's one of the non-essentials. And to prove that we do it, how much ire, if you're a young earther, how much ire comes to you right now when I put this as a non-essential? See, that's just a proof of my point. It's not one of the 16 fundamentals. Uh, it's not uh, how old the earth is. The Bible nowhere states how old the earth is. The Bible nowhere states and adds up the list even in Genesis. And maybe there's a closed chronology. Maybe there isn't. I have a sneaking suspicion when I look at Matthew 1.8, and it leaves out three generations from 1 Chronicles 3.11 to 14. Between Joram and Uzziah, so I have a sneaking suspicion there may be gaps in the genealogy. Be that as it may, it's not a fundamental. You want to believe in a young earth? Fine. Old earth? Fine. Uh, let's not uh, divide over that issue. And let's not make it a test for truth. We've got some overzealous young earthers going around the country 
Uh, and if you don't believe that the world was created in 144 hours, about 10,000 B.C. or less, uh, you're not really orthodox if indeed you're even saved. The name of the church, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopalian, I don't care if you belong to the first Episcopalian Bible church, you know, you have all of them in there. It's not essential what the name on the church is. The former church government, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregational, that's not one of the fundamentals. Now, I have beliefs on all of these, and I'm not saying they're not important. I'm saying they're not fundamentals, and you shouldn't divide fellowship over them. Let all things be done decently and in order. It's amazing how God can adapt himself to our idiosyncrasies. You know that? That God actually uh, can work in an Episcopalian form of government. As a matter of fact, most Baptist churches are Episcopal. They think they're <laughs> congregational. They only have one bishop, and he runs the whole show. That's an Episcopal <laughs> form of government. Uh, the mode of baptism, sprinkling, pouring, dipping. Now, I've got my uh, method, uh, and I think it's right, but I don't think it's one of the fundamentals. And it's not the only way you can picture salvation. Salvation is pictured as the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Now, I'm an immersionist. I'm Baptistic, but I don't think it's a fundamental of the faith. Some Baptists have made it a fundamental of the faith. In fact, the Church of Christ have made it an essential to salvation. I said to this one Church of Christ pastor who said, I mean, you've got to have faith, confession, repentance, and baptism to be saved. I said, no, wait a minute. If I believe, repent, confess my sins, and I want to be baptized, and I'm on the way to the tank, and I die, my, do I go to heaven or hell? Hell, he said. <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid that's carrying a good thing a little too far. <laughs> Type of music. You want to split a church? Right there. It's not one of the fundamentals. You know, it's amazing. God has blessed people through Gregorian chants. I have a friend who won't listen to any music after the 15th century. You know, well, bless him. God can work through that, too. I used to go every summer to Cornerstone. Uh, it had the 50 rock uh, bands there, rock and sock them every, every summer. People say, why do, you, why do you go there? Do you like that kind of music? I say, no, but when I go fishing, I don't put strawberries on the hook. That's my favorite dessert. I put worms. If they like worms, let them bite for Jesus. Get hooked for <laughs> Jesus. The ministry of women. You want to divide a church? You would swear that this one is very close to the color of the carpet issue. <coughs> the ministry of women. You can divide. It's not one of the fundamentals. I have my view on it, too. But it's not a fundamental of the faith. The time of Christ's coming. Now, you would think that with all the date setters there are in the world, that uh, this was really an important issue. I preach at a church twice every year for the last 25 years. And there were quite a few people in this church who believed that Christ was coming in 88. They believed 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 88. And uh, he's coming in October, a Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, so 1988, Feast uh, went by, October, and I was scheduled... Just think about this. To speak November 1st at the church. Now, now, now either, now either uh, they didn't really believe what they said, or they wanted me to speak to empty pews, one or the other. Uh, and then what happened? He didn't come in 88, so 89 reasons why he's going to come in 89. He who sitteth in the heavens will laugh. Verse out of context, but still... Uh, and it's true. The gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to start another civil war. Bring up this gift. Are they all, do they all exist today? Only some. None of them exist today. Tell you what, God desires the fruit of the Spirit over the gifts of the Spirit. That's why he sandwiched 1 Corinthians 13 between 12 and 14 on the gifts. Tell you what, also, God wants us to do the work of an evangelist even if you don't have the gifts. Say, well, I, I'm not gifted like Billy Graham. I don't have the gift. That doesn't mean you're not supposed to do the work of an evangelist. God wants us to use the one tongue we have over seeking many tongues we don't have. Even if the gift of tongues does exist, what does Paul say when it did exist in the first century and everybody agrees it did exist then? He said five words in a known language would be better than 20 minute message, 10,000 in an unknown language. Calvinism versus Arminianism. 
It's got to be a fundamental, right? Five-point Calvinism, five-point Calvinism, not a fundamental of the faith. Now, it's not that these are unimportant. I, I preach on all of them, and I have views on all of them. It's that they are not tests for orthodoxy, and they are not tests for Christian fellowship, and should not be uh, raised to the level of a fundamental. Shouldn't make a minor into a major. In all things, charity. Essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. We should love those with whom we differ. We should agree to disagree agreeably. Now, I had a real temptation. I had to practice what I preached on this one because when I wrote my book, Chosen But Free, and, and James White uh, wrote Potter's Freedom back, and I heard that uh, James uh, had uh, uh, temporarily uh, lost his eyesight by an operation. I must admit that the first thing that came in my mind was not a good thought. But instead, I resisted that thought and uh, wrote him a note and told him I was praying for him and for the restoration of his sight, which he got back. We should agree to disagree agreeably. We should be of the same mind even if we're not of the same opinion, Philippians 2. He didn't tell Eodius and soon Touchy, uh, or whatever her name was there, uh, <laughs> that they should be of the same opinion. He said, be of the same mind in the Lord. We should strive for unity, not uniformity. Now, I have to thank Dr. Merle Tenney, my teacher of the Gospel of John at Wheaton Graduate School for this, from his book, The Gospel of John. There is a difference between uniformity, this complete similarity of organization or of ritual, union, which implies political affiliation without necessarily including individual agreement, and unity, which requires oneness of inner heart and essential purpose through the possession of a common interest or a common life. Note, Jesus prayed for unity, not for uniformity, that's the era of Catholicism. And not for union, that's the era of ecumenism. He prayed for unity. Oneness of inner heart and essential purpose through the possession of a common interest or a common life. Then I looked at the creeds. And guess what I found? I found that the creeds seldom talked about the Bible. The Bible is the basis for the early creeds. And you probably can't improve on this statement, too. And I don't know who the first one who said this is. One Bible, two testaments, three creeds, four centuries, uh, four councils, and five centuries. That's basically what we all have in common. And if you examine those councils, four councils, and those three confessions, guess what you find? 14 soteriological doctrines. Number 15 implied and sometimes stated as the basis for it. And number 16, the implied method of interpretation by which they got those doctrines. The Bible is not the main topic of the creeds, but it's the basis for all of them. It refers, for example, in the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed, Scripture, Prophets, what the Lord Jesus, the Apostles taught, namely the New Testament are mentioned in the creeds. Only the Bible is infallible. The creeds are helpful. And I'll quote two great Catholics, the bookends of the Middle Ages, Augustine and Aquinas, 400, 1200. Augustine said, I've learned to yield this respect and honor only to the canonical books of Scripture. Of these alone do I most firmly believe that the authors were completely free from error. Does that look like Augustine believed in Inerrancy? Thomas Aquinas. We believe the prophets and apostles because the Lord has been their witness by performing miracles. And we believe the successors of the apostles and prophets, namely the fathers, only insofar as they tell us those things which the apostles and prophets have left in their writings. Creeds are helpful. Only the Bible is infallible. There's the Apostles' Creed. Guess what? There are all 14 doctrines, and they're numbered for you right there in the Apostles' Creed. The early fathers worked out historically what you can work out logically. The Nicene Creed, 325, guess what? 
there are all 14 of those doctrines in the Nicene Creed. And uh, I have them printed for you and uh, worked out. There's the Chalcedonian Creed of 451. One of the first things they said in it is following then the Holy Fathers. They were affirming the creeds before them, and then they too spell out the 14 or 15, depending on the uh, doctrine of the uh, Bible itself, the prophets down on the bottom there, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Conclusion. These early creeds contain all 14 doctrines necessary for salvation. This means that both logically and historically the same 14 essential doctrines emerge. It affirms the essential role of the Bible as well. The Bible is the stated basis for the creeds and a literal interpretation of the Bible is implied as the means of getting these doctrines. There are other doctrines too, creation and the universal church that are mentioned, but these are not necessary for salvation. Creation is an essential prerequisite to salvation. You've got to be a creature, and indeed a sinful creature, before you can be saved. The church has an important role in the second stage, sanctification, the body that can help edify, but the 14 are the crucial ones. So here we are, where we started. In essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. It's pretty hard to improve on either the brevity, clarity, or theological profundity of that statement. Three kinds of essentials, soteriological essentials, epistemological essentials, and a hermeneutical essential. May God help us to be essentialist and not trivialist. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to defend uh, your faith. You've said that we're committed to the defense of the faith. You've told us to contend for the faith and to uh, set apart the Lord in our heart and be ready always to give an answer to everyone. And as this group of men and women have come together for this very purpose, that on a scholarly level we might help to do that in an age in which the faith is under attack, help us always to keep our minds and hearts on what's really important and never make majors out of minors or minors out of majors.